This presentation is all about the importance of studying Bible prophecy. Why? It's all about Jesus. We're told in Revelation chapter 19, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Yes, it's all about Jesus. Let's begin with six basic things that we need to know about Bible prophecy. First, we need to know that God knows the future. In Acts chapter 15, Paul wrote, Known unto God are all of his works from the beginning of the world. God knows what will happen before it begins. Secondly, we need to know that God reveals the future before it happens. God said, I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 through 10. God reveals what he plans to do before he does it. Thirdly, we need to know that the Bible is full of prophecy. Why, God has put 18 books of prophecy in the Bible. He has put five books called the major prophets in the Bible. And he has put 12 books called the minor prophets in the Bible. He put the book of Revelation and whole chapters of prophecy in the Bible as well, such as Matthew's chapters 24 and 25. In fact, some say that there's between 25 and 40 cents of all scripture in the Bible has to do with Bible prophecy. So the Bible is full of prophecy. Fourthly, we need to know that the Bible, that the Bible, we need to know the Bible, fourthly, we need to know that Bible prophecy is reliable. God said, The prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. God's prophets had to be right 100% of the time. If it's not from God, then it's from Satan. Fifthly, we need to know that we have proof of the accuracy of prophecy. The Old Testament records more than 300 prophecies about the first coming of Jesus. Now, some prophecies are repeated two or three times. After the repetitions are removed, the Old Testament still records at least 108 specifically different prophecies about the first coming. Those 108 specifically different prophecies were literally fulfilled. Peter Stoner, professor emeritus of science at Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California, calculated the probability of just one person fulfilling just 48 prophecies to be, and there, and there you see the number, one with 127 zeros. Now a trillion has just 12 zeros. For many years, I worked at Moody Institute of Science, producing Moody Science films. The following is one such film entitled The Professor and the Prophets, featuring Dr. Erwin Moon. Moody Institute of Science. Are you interested in the future? Most of us are. But uh, the crystal ball in the science laboratory seems a little out of place, doesn't it? Well, it is out of place. Here's something else that some people feel is out of place in the science laboratory, and it also is concerned with the future. 
Did you know that more than one-third of this book is prophecy, detailed, specific prophecy concerning the future? Now the question is, is the Bible and the crystal ball the same? Are they equally out of place here? Well, there's a way to find out. We can bring scientific tests to bear upon this book to find out if the prophecies are actually true. And we're going to use the science of history and mathematics. By way of preparation, I recently spent several months visiting many of the places and nations that are prominent in Bible prophecy. The journey was not an easy one, for these places are scattered across thousands of miles of the turbulent Middle East. From the cool waters of the Mediterranean, down through the burning sands of the deserts of Arabia, to the far distant land of Iraq. But of all the places I visited, none plays a greater role in Bible prophecy than the ancient city of Jerusalem. Sacred to millions of Jews, Muslims, and Christians, Jerusalem is a city that 40 centuries of time and conquering armies could not trample into oblivion. But despite its long and tragic history, Jerusalem lives on as a principal scene and subject of Bible prophecy. One of the most startling and unusual of these prophecies has to do with the walls and gates to the city. Founded by walls on every side, Jerusalem can be entered only by one of several gates. Among these, the Dung Gate, Zion Gate, Jaffa Gate, New Gate, Damascus Gate, Herod's Gate, St. Stephen's Gate, and the Golden Gate. In biblical times, the Golden Gate entered directly into the court of the Temple of Solomon. It was the most important gate to the city. Because of this, it's not at all surprising to find that it's the subject of Bible prophecy. In Ezekiel, the 44th chapter, we read in the first verse, Then he brought me back by the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary, which looketh toward the east, and it was shut. Then saith the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut and it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. For 600 long years, the prophecy remained completely unfulfilled. And then on one spring day, about A.D. 30, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Israel, entered through the gate. And so the first part of the prophecy was fulfilled, but the second part, seemed utterly incredible. Remember, the Golden Gate, later, when Jerusalem was controlled by the Arabs, the Temple of Solomon was destroyed, entered now directly into the court occupied by the Dome of the Rock, or the Mosque of Omar. Since the building's completion, it has drawn faithful Muslims from all parts of the world. They come here to bow down to Allah, to offer prayers to Allah in the shadow of their sacred shrine. Because the Dome of the Rock could be most easily reached through the Golden Gate, it was logical that the gate should remain open. Certainly the Muslims had no reason to close the gate. In the 16th century, the Sultan Suleiman decided to rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem, and along with it, the Golden Gate. Uh, when he rebuilt the Golden Gate, an amazing, incredible thing happened. Immediately after the gate was restored, he had it shut, walled up with blocks of stone. Rebuild the gate and then wall it shut? It seemed impossible, and yet it happened. One thing is certain, every other gate to Jerusalem has remained open. Herod's Gate, St. Stephen's Gate, Damascus Gate, even the tiny Dung Gate. But the Golden Gate, the most important gate of all, fulfills to the letter the words of a prophecy made 25 centuries ago. This gate.
shall not be opened. The Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. Therefore it shall be shut. This is just one prophecy in the Bible. And there are, of course, hundreds of others every bit as amazing. For example, about a hundred miles south of the city of Jerusalem is the city of Petra, one of the strangest cities in the world. In Bible times, it was referred to as Sela, and the general region as Mount Seir. Now, there are no broad highways to Petra, only a narrow trail that winds through the tortuous El Cid Canyon, whose walls of rock rise sharply hundreds of feet toward the sky. For more than a mile, El Cid is a dream world of murky shadows and eternal silence. Then, a gigantic temple, not built of wood or stone, but sculpted from the rose-red rock of a mountainside. It is the legendary Kaznet Berlin. But there is more to come, on through another canyon, till it widens into a tremendous valley, and carved in the cliffs of the valley are the temples, the palaces, and the tombs of Petra. Year after year, Petra expanded in size and power, for it commanded the caravan routes that channeled the treasures of Arabia and the Far East to the hungry markets of Greece and Rome. But as Petra's wealth and culture grew by leaps and bounds, the city grew even more swiftly in pride, arrogance, and cruelty. Symbolic of Petra's wickedness are the relics of its religion. Giant obelisks cut from a mountain top to honor Dushara, the god of the sun. Altars of stone and a pool. What was it for? The Bible says these people shed innocent blood. Perhaps this pool was a labor where priests of Dushara could wash off the blood of human sacrifice. Protected by the narrow gateway to their city, the Petrans felt confident that no one could despoil them of their treasures, nor punish them for their sins. But the prophecies of God rang out against the pagan city. O thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, that holdest the height of the hill, though thou shouldst make thy nest as high as the eagle, I will bring thee down from thence, saith the Lord. Centuries passed. It seemed that Petra would endure forever but neither time nor circumstance could thwart the fulfillment of prophecy. And it all happened so simply. A new trade route opened up, a route that bypassed Petra in favor of Palmyra, a city to the north. Here was the blow that cut the proud city to the heart. As Petra's commerce, her life's blood began to drain away. Soon the people left the houses they had labored so long to build they abandoned their temples and the tombs of their dead. They emptied the great amphitheater whose tears they had hammered and chiseled from solid rock. Imagine the tremendous effort to strip away a whole mountainside, to remove ton after ton of rock. And then imagine the amphitheater jammed with thousands of Petra's citizens. How they would have laughed to hear some prophet foretell the desertion of their city. Yet today, the prophecies have come true, and the only spectators left are a flock of goats. Reminders of Isaiah's prediction, the wild beasts of the desert shall meet with the wolves, and the wild goat shall cry out to his fellow. A few birds nest among the ruins, for, as the Bible foretold, the owl and the raven shall dwell in it. There shall the vultures be gathered. Thus saith the Lord, thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof. So again, Bible prophecy is fulfilled. Not by mighty armies, nor by great battles, but simply by the change of a trade route. The city of rock, built to last forever, has become a lifeless valley, filled with the tumbled wreckage of Petra's glory. 600 miles from the hidden city of Petra flow the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, 
watering the ancient land of Mesopotamia. The finest city to grow up in this fertile plain was Babylon, a city of such wonder and luxury that King Nebuchadnezzar could boast, is not this great Babylon that I have built. Of Babylon's past greatness, only fragments remain. Sections of a highway that once trembled with Nebuchadnezzar's armies. Remnants of a city wall once acclaimed the finest ever built. And the worn and faded symbols of imperial splendor. Babylon's rise had been swift. But as she soared to dizzy heights of strength and beauty, she also slipped ever deeper into the mire of lust and perversion. For this, her doom was sealed. And it shall come to pass that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolation. For many years it seemed that the prophecy was not going to be fulfilled. In fact, for more than half a century, Babylon reigned as queen city of the civilized world. Then, one October night in 539 B.C., the royal banquet hall of Babylon rang with the sound of laughter and shouting. Belshazzar the king was holding a great feast. Suddenly the tumult gave way to a deathly silence. As the fingers of a hand appeared and wrote these words, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Ufarsi. God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. To those who rode the crest of Babylon's greatness, the prophecy must have seemed incredible. But that very night, the night of Belshazzar's feast, the Medes and the Persians entered the city. Belshazzar was slain. The empire was divided. And Babylon, once powerful, prosperous, and proud, began to melt into a desolation, a dry land, and a desert. Now Babylon is a place for foxes to dig holes, a place for jackals to scurry across barren hillsides, a place for storks to come and build their nests. All these in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. For more than 2,000 years, the ruins of Babylon have borne silent testimony to the accuracy of Bible prophecy. The land shall tremble in sorrow, for every purpose of the Lord shall be performed to make the land of Babylon a desolation without an inhabitant. Along with Jerusalem, Petra, and Babylon, the famous merchant center of Tyre was also given an important place in Bible prophecy. The prophecies about Tyre are quite remarkable. In fact, they are the most amazing set of prophecies in all of history. Let me read them to you. In Ezekiel chapter 26, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He shall slay thy people by the sword, and thy strong garrisons shall go down to the ground. Behold, I will cause many nations to come up against thee, and they shall lay thy stones thy timber, and thy dust in the midst of the water. And I will make thee like the top of a rock. Thou shalt be a place to spread nets upon. Thou shalt be built no more, for I, the Lord, have spoken it. In 586 B.C., Tyre came under attack by Nebuchadnezzar. Eventually, his troops smashed their way into the city. But by then, the people had escaped with their treasure to an island just off the coast. Here the invaders were halted. They had no ships to carry them out to the island. Now the city lay in ruins for some 240 years, and the people continued to live on the island there with their treasure. Then finally, in 333 BC, Alexander the Great marched his armies up against the city of Tyre. Of course, he found the city in ruins. But he couldn't attack the island because the people, forewarned, had built a strong underwater network, so cunningly contrived that the rise and fall of the tide couldn't choke them with sand. One look at these rugged barriers was enough for Alexander. 
He saw at once that if he attacked by sea, his invasion craft would be smashed to bits. The people on the island breathed a little easier. It seemed that their enemy was stalemated. And yet Alexander was not easily discouraged. He conceived a very spectacular plan of battle, one that has never been equaled in history. He decided to build a roadway from the mainland out to the island, march his troops across this roadway through the sea and capture the island. But where was he to get the amount of material necessary? Well, the answer was obvious. The material from the ancient city of Tyre. And so he put his armies to work. And stone by stone and brick by brick and timber by timber, the whole of that city was thrown into the sea, literally. And when that wasn't enough, they even scraped the dust and threw it into the sea to make the roadway to the island. And so, exactly as predicted, they left the site of Tyre as flat and barren as the top of a rock. Today, centuries of drifting sand have covered Alexander's causeway. The fulfillment of prophecy has actually transformed the geography of Lebanon. And what was once an island is now part of a broad peninsula. On the tip of the peninsula is a small town that now carries the name of Tyre. But this town is built on what used to be the island and not a part of ancient Tyre. The large and powerful city of ages past is gone. Today, on the spot where Tyre stood, humble fishermen come to ply their trade. Tyre, the city of the finest seamen, the wealthiest merchants, the bravest explorers, has become, as the Bible foretold, a place for the spreading of nets. Ancient Tyre has never been rebuilt, though it has a fine location for commerce, rich, fertile land, and the fresh water of Ras Elaine Springs, more than enough to meet the needs of a great city. For down through the centuries echoes the Bible's unshakable prophecy against Tyre. Thou shalt be built no more, for I the Lord have spoken it. Now the detailed accuracy with which these prophecies have been fulfilled is really quite amazing, isn't it? How do you explain it? Well, for some people, the explanation is really quite simple. Their theory is that the prophets were just lucky. They made a lot of wild guesses, and they just happened to come true. If that's the case, just how lucky would these prophets have had to be? Is there an answer to this question? Yes, in fact, there is an entire branch of mathematics devoted to solving problems of just this type. It's that branch which deals with the theory of probability. And we are extremely fortunate in having an expert in the field of mathematics here to help us understand this. Professor Peter W. Stoner. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Sit down, won't you? Professor Stoner has been the head of the Department of Mathematics and Astronomy at Pasadena City College for many years, and uh, more recently at Westmont College in Santa Barbara. Professor Stoner, in addition to being an expert in the field of mathematics, has also had another interest that particularly fits our subject, for he's been interested in Bible prophecy. Uh, Professor, that book of yours, Science Speaks, has been a very great help to me personally, and has also helped us a lot in preparation of the material for this particular subject. No, it's very gratifying. Uh, can you tell us just a bit about this theory of probability and how it works? Certainly, Dr. Moon. The principle of probability is really very simple, and we can illustrate it in many different ways. Such as? Well, let's take the case of probability where we're dealing with independent events. And say we illustrate by asking the question, what is the chance of a man becoming bald and losing a finger? Well, those are unrelated events, aren't they? Yes, they certainly are. And if we know the chance of each one occurring, we can compute the chance that they will both happen to the same person. Let me illustrate. Let us just suppose that one man in ten goes bald. And that one man in hundred sometime loses a finger. 
then the probability that one man will both become bald and lose a finger is the product of these two, or one in ten times one in a hundred, which is one in one thousand. So the rule is, if we want the probability of a series of independent events happening, we first establish estimates of the fulfillment of each event, then we multiply the results and we obtain the probability that the whole series will come true. Exactly how do you apply this to Bible prophecy? I took several prophecies and submitted them to some 12 different classes representing some 600 college students and asked them to carefully examine the prophecies and produce the estimates that they thought were conservative. After about a year's research, they came up with values affecting the prophecies and the particular ones which you have used are as follows. The probability of the Golden Gate prophecy coming true was about one in 1,000. To arrive at this, the student had to estimate how many gates out of all the ancient wall cities were sealed up. The prophecy with respect to Mount Seir and its capital Petra being conquered was given as estimate of one in ten. The probability of its laying desolate thereafter was given as one in fifty. The probability of its never being re-inhabited was given as one in one hundred. With respect to Babylon, the probability of its being destroyed was agreed upon as one in ten, that it would never be re-inhabited as one in one hundred. The chance that Tyre would be destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar was agreed upon as one in two. The chance that other nations would participate in the destruction was given as one in five. The chance that its stones, timbers, and dust would be laid in the sea was given as one in ten. The chance that it would be made flat like the top of a rock as one in two thousand. The chance that it would later become a place for the spreading of nets as one in ten. The chance that it would never be rebuilt as one in twenty. I see. Well, then your next step would be to calculate the probability of all the prophecies coming true. That's right. Now, obviously, these are not precise figures, but only crude guesses. There are also problems associated with selecting prophecies and with the possible dependency of the events. But to get some idea of what is involved in fulfilled prophecies, we multiply these together and come out with a tremendous figure of one in two quintillion. Of course, that is the chance so small that it is quite impossible for the human mind to conceive of it. Yes, let's try. Let's suppose we had two quintillion silver dollars, and we marked one of those silver dollars, straight into the whole mass. Then we took all of these silver dollars to the state of Texas. Texas has an area of a little more than a quarter of a million square miles. We will spread our silver dollars out on the surface of Texas. They will cover the entire state of Texas to a depth of about 35 feet. Now we will blindfold a man and send him out to get that silver dollar. He may travel as far as he wishes across Texas. He may dig as deep as he pleases. But at the end, he must come up with a silver dollar and say, this is it. What chance does he have? Well, it is about the same chance that we would have of your prophecies coming true, providing they were written in human knowledge. But they did come true to the very last minute detail. Thank you so much, Professor Stoner. That's been a wonderful help. The accuracy of Bible prophecy is an amazing thing. So far as I know, there is not one bit of Bible prophecy up to this point that has not been fulfilled. And to me, this is the strongest evidence of the divine origin of this book. 
But the prophecies in the Bible do not concern cities and nations and people alone. Oh, there is even more about nations and people just ahead, for this book is far more up to date than tomorrow morning's newspaper. But even more important are the prophecies in this book concerning your future and mine. Where are they? They run from the beginning of the Bible clear through to the end. Now, I'm not going to attempt to interpret them for you or even to read them to you. I'd like to help you find them, though. The Gospel of John is a particularly good place to start, for it tells us much about where we're going to spend eternity and why. In the first chapter, for example, but to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And then in the third chapter, the 36th verse, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And so on, through the book, page after page, until we come to the next to the last chapter. And we read in the 31st verse, But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, ye might have life through his name. Yes, this is the most important book in all the world. It tells us not only where we came from, what we're doing while we're here, but it also tells us where we're going. May I suggest that this book should be your prime study in these important days. Yes, the amount of proof is overwhelming. With the odds being so great for one person to fulfill just 48 prophecies, one must wonder what the odds would be for one person to fulfill all 108 prophecies. Fulfilled prophecies is the indisputable proof that Jesus is Messiah, that God knows the end from the beginning, that God is in control, and the Bible is the Word of God. There are 999 direct prophetic utterances in the Old Testament scriptures. 666 prophecies have to do with places and things, namely cities, battles, events, nations, etc. 333 of those prophecies are directed towards the birth, the ministry, the life, the betrayal, trial, death, and burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Sixth, we need to know what Peter said about Bible prophecy. In 2 Peter chapter 1, he wrote, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter said four things. First of all, one, Bible prophecy is sure or accurate. Secondly, you would do well, or at least be wise, to pay attention to Bible prophecy. Thirdly, Bible prophecy is, is like a light. Fourthly, Bible prophecy was given by the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to give you ten reasons why we would be wise to study Bible prophecy. First, we would be wise to study Bible prophecy because it teaches accountability. In Hebrews 9.27, Paul said, It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So, Bible prophecy teaches us to prepare for what comes after death. Secondly, we would be wise to study Bible prophecy because it changes lives. John would write in his epistle, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. 
But we know that when he is revealed, that is Jesus, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So Bible prophecy causes people to give up their sins, so to speak, so we should use it. Thirdly, we would be wise to study Bible prophecy because loving the second coming will be a reward. Paul said, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So, this is the only doctrine mentioned in the Bible that will be rewarded with a crown. Fourthly, we would be wise to study Bible prophecy because of what Jesus said as he told the parable of the wheat and the tares. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus said, Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire, where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So Jesus said the lost will be removed from the earth at the end of the age. Next in number five, we would be wise to study Bible prophecy because of what Jesus said in the parable of the dragnet. Going back to Matthew chapter 13, we read these words. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore. And they sat down and they gathered the good into vessels, but they threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire, where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So we should tell the lost what Jesus said. It's, it's very important. Number six, we would be wise to study Bible prophecy because it's something the disciples were interested in. Going back to Matthew, this time chapter 24, where we read in verse 3, Now as he, Jesus, sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now, there's nothing wrong with being interested in Bible prophecy. Why? Well, the disciples were interested in it. Number seven. We would be wise to study Bible prophecy because Jesus wants us to be patient. There in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will receive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Certainly, we live in a time today where there are many wars, and almost daily, rumors of wars. Now, Jesus was saying many things must happen before the end of the age arrived. Number eight, we would be wise to study Bible prophecy because Jesus said the end will come. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said these words, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now Jesus, not some cook, said, Then shall the end come. Love and mercy are why he has waited. Jesus doesn't want to judge the world, but he will eventually do it. Number nine. We would be wise to study Bible prophecy because of what Jesus said in the Great Commission. As he signed off in Matthew chapter 28, he gave this command. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, 
I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Amen. Yes, the end of the age will come. In the meantime, we should be active. Number 10, we would be wise to study Bible prophecy because it pleases God. In the Old Testament, in 1 Chronicles, we read these words. The sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were two hundred, and all their brethren were at their command. So we see God is pleased with those who understand the signs and tell his people what they need to do. He reveals these things for the good of all mankind. Did you know that the second coming is mentioned 23 of the 27 New Testament books? That it is mentioned in one out of every 30 verses in the New Testament? That if we don't believe in the second coming, we don't believe many scriptures. Jesus said, the end of the age will come. Now, is water baptism important? Why, yes, water baptism is important. But for every verse of scripture about water baptism, there are more than 20 verses of scripture about the second coming. So what should this tell us? Going back to the Great Commission, where Jesus said, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, we're told to observe all things. That means the church should teach all nations to observe everything Jesus taught, including watching for the second coming. Now, are these events important? Let's look at a few. First of all, the flight of Joseph and Mary into Egypt with the baby Jesus. Is this important? Well, certainly it is. How about the night that Jesus spoke to Nicodemus and told him how he needed to be born again. The whole theology of being born again, is this important? Well, certainly so. The parable of the lost sheep, is this important? Yes, it is. How about the story of the rich man and Lazarus? Certainly this is important. Why? Well, we see the demise of the rich man, how he ended up in hell. What a warning. These events are very important. But these are just a few of the many events that are mentioned just once in the New Testament. Now, if these events that are mentioned just once in the New Testament are very important, what are we to think about something that's mentioned more than 300 times? So, here are 10 reasons why we should want the end of the age to arrive. First, Jesus will reign. He will be worshipped and so forth. Secondly, there will finally be peace, justice, and righteousness upon the earth. Certainly, we want to see that, do we not? Thirdly, Satan will be bound and chained. We can't wait until that day comes. The creation will be restored. Multitudes will get saved. The Jews will be saved, all of Israel. God's covenants with Israel will finally be fulfilled. Christians will reign with Jesus. And Christians will then see loved ones. And we're told that Christians won't get sick or die. So we should look forward to these things. One final remark about the importance of studying Bible prophecy. If God didn't want us to study these scriptures, all we had to do was leave them out of the Bible. But God put them in the Bible. He told us to study them. He told us we would be wise to study them. And he told us that he would reward us if we do study them. So, here we come to the end of understanding, perhaps, the importance of studying 
Bible prophecy. If you have any questions, certainly the Bible is filled with answers. We're told to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth.